um, last week about this matter of praying for Israel. Now, now we ought to pray for their salvation, but uh, to take a verse out of the Old Testament that's totally out of context to say we're commanded to pray for Israel today, that has no justification because three times in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was told by God, do not pray for Israel. Do not pray for them. But did anybody have a question? Then, Mark, maybe you could uh, pass these out uh, this morning before we go into something uh, different. But anybody have any question, any comment, or any observation about any of the verses or anything that we, um, we dealt with uh, in the past? Any question or comment? Any uh, observation? Now, uh, this morning, what I want to deal with is, uh, uh, or anybody have any question about anything or want to add something or uh, mention anything, uh, you know, about those past things? It's just that these things come up, and we, as God's children, I believe, need to know what the Bible teaches so that we correctly interpret the Bible. And uh, not just that we're against something or for something, but we ought to know why we're against something and why we're uh, for something. But uh, this morning, I want to deal with the Bible doctrine of the church. Now, this is probably the single most misunderstood doctrine uh, amongst Christians today. Now, in other words, almost nobody is straight on the Bible teaching about the church. Hardly anybody teaches what the Bible teaches about the, uh, the, the church, the local uh, church. Now, in the outline there, what we see here, and we'll just uh, cover it and uh, not go into all the verses because we don't have the time, but uh, see, number one, see, the church is a divine institution. In other words, see, the church was established by God. See, it's God's institution in the world today. Now, uh, that's very, very important to realize that the church is a divine institution. Now, that does not mean that the church is perfect, because it's certainly not perfect, but, see, it was instituted by God. Just like, for instance, marriage, the institution of marriage was instituted by God. See, it was God's idea. See, the church is God's idea. It originated with God. It's a divine institution. Now, see, it did not originate with man. It has nothing to do uh, with man. Now, for instance, if you turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, you see uh, he's writing here to the church at Corinth. And uh, Corinth, of course, is a local um, city, that uh, a, a literal uh, city. And obviously he's writing here to a local church. And he says here, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. Now, the word of means origin or source in the Bible. And um, most of the time, see, of God. Now, he says that the church at Corinth is the church of God. Now, when we study the book of uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, we find they had a lot of problems in the church. It was far from a, per a perfect church. But you see, Paul, as we read the Word of God in the book of Acts, he established the church. He never said it was his church, but he refers to it, see, as the church of God. In 1 Timothy 3.15, it's referred to as the church of the living God. See, see, it's God's church. Now, he's writing there to local churches. They were not perfect, but they were divine institutions. Now, uh, number two there, see, Christ is the founder and the head of the church. See, Jesus said, I will build my church. In Ephesians 5, it says that Christ is the head of the church, just like the husband is the head of the wife. Christ is the head of um, the church. So he's the founder of the church. That's why in Romans 6, 16, Paul writes there and he refers to the churches as the churches of Christ. Let's uh, turn over to it. Romans 16 and verse 16. 
you see. And uh, he says in Romans 6.16, uh, salute one another with a holy kiss. And uh, the churches of Christ salute you. See, so he refers to them as the churches of Christ. Now, why would he refer to the churches that he founded, that he was associated with, um, as the churches of Christ? See, Christ was the founder of the church. See, now, that's what we need to uh, realize. See, the churches of Christ uh, uh, salute you. So Christ is the founder and the head of the church. Now, um, very few people believe that. There are very few Christians that believe that. You see, now, uh, for instance, um, there is no Christian organization or parachurch group that can say that. See, that, uh, that they're a divine institution founded and their head is Jesus Christ. See, no school can say that. See, they have no authority to say that. See, that is specifically uh, mentioned in relation to the local church. See, a person says, well, we have this organization. We uh, uh, send us money and this, that, and the other thing. See, none of them are divine institutions. None of them have been established by Jesus Christ, no matter what they say. Because, see, the church is God's divine institution. Now, uh, for instance, I heard of someone who uh, was a head of an organization, a big organization. See, and most of the parachurch groups, they take in more money in churches and they, uh, they have, many of them have millions of dollars, literally. I'm not exaggerating. See, in most of the heads of these Christian organizations, they live in houses, five, 10, 20 million dollar homes. And, but anyway, the thing, uh, is that they had this secret session with this, uh, with their leaders. And this was a prominent Christian group. And so the thing that was brought up is why, uh, or what authority somebody brought up. In fact, somebody taped it and gave me the tape. And that, so that's why I know this. See, this was a secret meeting of this big parachurch group. And, um, so this Christian organization, and they said, what authority do we have to be in existence? Now, and the head of the organization said, we have no biblical authority. See, and this was in a secret meeting that they had. They said, we have no biblical authority. For instance, did Peter, Paul, or John ever establish an organization? Absolutely not. See, all of their ministry was in and through the local church. See, Paul started churches and nothing else. There's no organization, no ministry uh, outside of the local church. See, most people don't believe that. Well, anyway, they said that we have no biblical authority to do that, to have any Christian organization uh, today. Now, they have this organization, they ask for money, they get a lot of money in, and so forth. But in that secret meeting, they brought out they have no biblical authority. See, they have no divine authority for their Christian organization. Now, the leader of that organization said this. Now, I'm talking about any organization, radio, television, uh, schools, Bible colleges, whatever. Say, uh, whatever Christian organization outside the church. Um, but they said this, they said that the only way that we can say that we have divine authority is because, say, years ago, uh, the Roman Catholic Church started these various orders. You know, in the Roman Catholic Church, they have different orders. And, uh, and believe it or not, this is a Christian organization, believe the Bible, salvation, and so forth. But they said that the closest thing to our authority would be to go back to the Roman Catholic Church because they established these different orders. And so we have the authority to establish different orders today. I mean, you see how bizarre it is? See, they go back to the Roman Catholic Church. It has nothing to do with the Bible. But the interesting thing 
is they admit it that they have no biblical authority. See, but uh, why? Because see, the church is a divine institution. It's not perfect, but it's a divine institution. And the founder and head of the church is Jesus Christ. He said, I will build my church. See, uh, and there's no question about that. And again, see, the early apostles founded churches and they found it nothing else. They, the only thing they found it uh, were churches. Now, see, and then in 1 Timothy 3.15, the Bible says the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. See, that's the church. See, see God has given his wisdom to the church, his knowledge, the word of God, and it's referred to. It's a great verse. Let's turn to it. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter uh, 3 and verse uh, 15. Now, in 1 Timothy 3.15, um, see, he says, um, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. See, it's the church of the, the pillar and ground of the truth. See, God has deposited all of his truth in the local New Testament church. Now, that was certainly true in the New Testament. He deposited that. They had the Word of God uh, through the apostles in uh, the local New Testament church. But you see, it's the pillar and ground of the truth. See, that means it holds up, it defends the truth, and it preaches the truth in the world today. How does God get out His truth today in uh, the world? And the Bible teaches it's through uh, the local uh, a church. Now, um, so that's why it's the pillar and ground of truth. Now, uh, the church is God's unique uh, edifying agency. Now, see, we hear a lot today about discipleship. See, and uh, a lot of people talk about that, a lot of books written about it. See, um, that's totally unscriptural. Say, discipleship. God's program for discipleship is the local church. See, not some parachurch organization, not some author, not some school, but it's the local church. Now, why do you say that? Turn to Ephesians chapter uh, 4 and uh, verses 11 and 12. Now, in Ephesians 4, 11 and uh, 12, and the Bible says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And by the way, the pastors and teachers, that's the same word. And for, see, the perfecting of the saints, that the word perfecting means to mature, to develop. He's talking here about the local church. And God gives gifts to the church, and we read about uh, those gifts. And he says here, uh, for the perfecting of the saints, see, the maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And there, of course, we learn that the ministry is carried on by God's children. See, it's not carried on by pastors, see, but by God's children. See, as he um, says here, for the perfecting of the saints, see, to maturing, developing. That's what the church is all about. See, the church is the discipleship station. See, to get in church, hear the word of God, to grow and develop as God's children. And then it says, see, in verse 12, for the work of the ministry. Now, the work of the ministry is carried on by the saints of God. See, the children of God. See, every child of God is a minister and should be ministering throughout the week. What? Being a witness for Christ, uh, building people up, being a testimony, and carrying on the ministry of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, and, um, but you see, that's the purpose of the church. See, that's not the purpose of an organization. That's not the purpose of a school. That's the purpose of the church. That's why people need to be faithful to the church. And that's why the Bible says um, it is assumed in the New Testament that everybody that gets saved gets in the church and uh, gets built up in the local uh, church. There is no other way to do it in the New Testament, especially in the New Testament. They only had, most of the time, a church just had one letter Later on, they had the letter circulated, they had more than one letter. But if you weren't in church, you didn't get uh, the Word of God. And so, you see, it's the center of God's edifying 
uh, agency and unique uh, agency. Now, see, uh, number five in the outline, it's a unique place where God speaks to his children. Now, see, the seven churches of Revelation begins with Ephesus, it ends with Laodicea, and the thing that we read there is that he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You see, the churches. See, now there are seven churches. And by the way, this is a neglected part of the book of the Revelation. See, every, all the prophetic Bible teachers, they skip over the first three chapters. And, uh, or actually the first five chapters. And, uh, but you see, he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. God speaks through the church. That's how God speaks to God's children is through the local New Testament church. That's the way it was done in the New Testament, and certainly that's the way it should be done uh, today. Now, a lot of times we neglect that. See, it doesn't say, he that hath an ear, let him hear. See, but uh, let's turn to it. For instance, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7, now, and we read here in uh, verse 7. See, it says, he, now you got the message to the seven churches. Here's the message to the church at Ephesus. See, now, see, he addresses the churches. See, again, um, this book of Revelation is not given to an individual, but to churches. Now, in verse 7 of Revelation 2, he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. And a lot of times people leave that out. But then it goes on and says, unto the churches. Amen. See, God speaks to the church. God speaks through uh, the church. See, uh, and you see that very clearly uh, in uh, the Word of God. And then uh, um, uh, number six there, it's God's unique and only uh, ordinance observing institution. Now, um, an agency, for instance, Baptism. See, baptism is a local church ordinance. See, it's not done outside the church. It's not done wherever and when anybody wants it done. See, it's a local church ordinance. And the Lord's Supper, see, are to be observed in the New Testament church. Only, in other words, uh, like the Lord's Supper. Obviously, when we study the Bible about the Lord's Supper, it's only for baptized believers who are in the church. Amen? See, there's no such thing as um, uh, just observing the Lord's Supper outside the church. See, and uh, the same with baptism. See, they were baptized, and then as we read the book of Acts, they were added to the church. See, or they were baptized by uh, an authority from a local church. And then they were added to the church. So, see, but those things are exclusively the responsibility of the church and not outside uh, the church. For instance, I heard uh, a well-known Bible teacher, and he had a question and answer program last week. And because uh, I get these, all these different radio, Christian radio networks throughout the United States, and uh, through my uh, internet radio, and if you want to have any information about that, check with Dave, and uh, you can get one. And so you can plug in any station, I guess, in the world, literally in the world to get them. So I have these four different networks, and I listen to them, a f uh, not a lot, you know, maybe when I'm eating or something like that. Uh, I'm not addicted to them at all, but uh, almost every time they come on, they have some heresy that they're promoting. And for instance, this Bible teacher, somebody asked, uh, and they said, well, if I feel like observing the Lord's Supper uh, at home, don't you think that's all right? Now, this well-known Bible teacher said, oh, that's fine. He said, that's great. You want to observe the Lord's Supper. You can do it anytime, anyplace. You can do it at your home. That's all right. Now, see, that shows that that man knows nothing about, see, this is why we're dealing with it, the Bible doctrine of the local church. He doesn't know anything about the local church. That is a church ordinance. That is not something that I do when I feel like doing it on my own accord. See, that's a church ordinance. Same with baptism. 
Say, uh, uh, baptism is under the authority of a local church. You see that in the book of Acts and very clearly uh, in the Bible. But um, you see, it's the church where these ordinances are observed. Say, not at home, uh, not with some uh, group that takes a trip to Israel and, uh, or they have some conference that you go to and they observe the Lord's Supper. See, anybody that does that or advocates that or any Christian school that advocates that, it shows they know nothing about the Bible doctrine of the church. See, they don't know anything about the church. See, they're usurping the authority of the local church. Now, to answer that question, the person should have said, well, number one, you need to be in a local church and that's a local church ordinance. See, that is not something you do on your own whenever you uh, uh, feel like it. Now, so, uh, see, that's clear in the Bible. Now, again, most everybody is not scripturally based in the Bible doctrine of the church. See, um, the church is different than the Girl Scouts, uh, Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts or the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. You see, it's God's unique agency and it's a divine uh, agency. And then it's God's unique and only officer functioning agency. And there you have uh, bishops, that's the word pastor and deacons. See, and that's the pastor and deacons in a local church. See, and, um, but as we think about that, see, that's, church offices, see, um, that's talking about the local church. See, when Paul talks to Timothy about the pastors and the deacons and the qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3, obviously he's talking about the local church. See, and um, for instance, these Christian organizations, they say we have a board of directors. Well, where do you read about that in the Bible? These Christian schools, Bible schools, we have a board of directors. Now, see the point I'm getting at? Say, how do you fit that in with the Bible? Say, you're doing something that the Bible says you should not do. Say, you're not under the authority of a local church. Now, by the way, all the Christian organizations say they believe in the local church. And all the Christian organizations and institutions and radio broadcast and all kinds of stuff. And they say, we believe in the importance of the local church. Well, what they mean by that is that, see, the local church is a place where they get their money to defend their ministry, see, and their chosen ministry, what they want to do. But you see, you'll never hear of a Christian organization that believes in the centrality of the local church. You see, there's a difference in saying I believe in the importance of it and believing in the centrality of it. See, none of them believe in the centrality of it. And then, um, you see, they, they do not uh, believe in the primacy of the local church. See, I don't know of a Christian school that believes in the primacy and the centrality of the local church. They say, well, we have our board of trustees, this, that, and the other thing. And, uh, uh, but you see, where do you fit that in, in the Bible? Now, you see, most people are way off and out left field when it comes to this uh, uh, teaching. And then uh, number eight there in the outline, see, it's God's unique disciplining agency. See, and we read about church discipline uh, in the Bible. Jesus spoke about it, bring it before the church. We read about it um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There's such a thing as discipline. When somebody gets into moral or doctrinal error, they should be disciplined. See, and that's the disciplining agency is the local church. See, that's where people are disciplined. So um, if someone is not in a local church, how can they be disciplined? Just like you got these Christian schools, these different organizations. And... Um, I think of a couple of them that I observed, and uh, I mentioned that uh, to a friend of mine. I said, that guy that's ahead of that school, I don't believe he's right with God. 
I said, I believe he's either on drugs. This is a Christian school. And if I mentioned everybody would know it. I said, he's either on drugs or an alcoholic. And uh, as time went on, I was proven right. There's another Bible school. And uh, they showed the camera, the chapel. And I said, this guy teaching at this Christian Bible school is not right with God. You say, how do you know that, Pastor? It's written all over his face. You could see. Uh, anybody had any discernment, you could discern that that man was not right with God. Well, anyway, he had to leave the school in disgrace. And the school covers all these things up and they don't say anything about them. And he leaves the school in dis disgrace. But see what I'm saying, say it's not the job of a school to discipline somebody. Say that's the job of a local church. And if someone is not in a local church and they are in doctrinal era or moral era, how are they gonna be disciplined, amen? See, they just go on and on uh, and on, just like this um, fella that was involved in apologetics. Uh, and he was, after he died, it was proven that he was, I hate to say it, but he was a sex pervert. Uh, Robbie Zacharias, did you ever hear of him? He was on the radio. He took in $25 million the year before he died. Then after he died, it was proven that he was uh, had all these uh, moral problems. Now, uh, I heard him on the radio, and anybody that would ask me about Rabbi, Rabbi Zacharias, I'd say, you need your head examined if you listen to him. This was before he ever fell. Now, here's the reason why I said that. If you would hear him, he is the... He is the um, hero of all these spectacular stories. See, I was in Vietnam, and the way he talked, everybody in Vietnam got saved under his ministry. And then uh, he mentions about these, uh, he mentioned about one of these leaders of one of these uh, Arab states, and uh, I talked to him, and uh, he, he seemed to want to accept Christ as his savior. And all. See, he is the hero of every story. See, he was not preaching Jesus Christ. He was preaching Rabbi Zacharias. You see, and then after he dies, it's proven. That's why the whole thing. And another reason why uh, I told any, as anybody, listen to him, you need your head examined. He owned a massage parlor in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, uh, and it was later on proven that that was not the most reputable place for people to go to. Now, he owned that. Personally, he owned that. And somebody, I believe was here in New Jersey, gave him $500,000 to buy that place. See, I'm talking about Christian organizations now. And uh, by the way, he dedicated that, and they had a big ri ribbon-cutting ceremony, and they had the leading Southern Baptist pastor from Georgia there. They had the governor of the state there. I don't know, it's a crazy world in which we live, to dedicate a massage parlor. Now, the problem is that, see, he was way out in left field, but that... Baptist pastor of the largest Southern Baptist church in Georgia, he no longer is in the ministry because of moral problems. I mean, you see, th this is outside the church. See, these guys do not come under the authority of the local church. See, and they're doing things that are all types uh, ridiculous. But you see, it's the disciplinary agency. Now, it's God's unique gospel spreading agency. In other words, say, Every member of a local church ought to be an evangelist. Every member of the local church ought to be a witness for Christ. See, we all ought to be witnessing for Christ and getting out um, uh, the word of God. There's no question about that. See, the Great Commission, go into all the world, see, and what is it? See, you baptize, see, or first of all, you evangelize, make people disciples, 
you baptize and you teach. And that's the ministry of the local New Testament church. That's what the church is all about, to evangelize, baptize, and teach. See, that's um, the local church uh, ministry. And then it's God's unique and only agency to train, authorize, send uh, forth pastors, evangelists, and missionaries. Um, this is the responsibility of local churches. It's not the job of a school or a college or a university that many times are not under the authority of a local church. See, they, they say they are, but they're not, of course. And, um, and how say that most churches have uh, abdicated this uh, responsibility. Now, see, the thing about that is, see, how were preachers trained in the New Testament? In the New Testament, how were they trained? See, they were trained in the local church, Paul and Timothy. See, in the local church. And where did they prove themselves in a local church? See, now, for instance, somebody can go to a Christian college, be a terrible testimony in their local church, and um, even have a lot of hang-ups. They go to a Christian college, they graduate in four years, and then they become a pastor. See, where did they ever prove themselves? See, uh, but see, it all goes back to the local church. See, that's where someone proves themselves. That's where someone shows whether uh, they're fit to be in the ministry. You see, it's through the local church, not through a college or some uh, uh, organization uh, like that. So, uh, you see, they graduate from a college. Uh, they can be in doctrinal era. For instance, uh, I've heard different students, you know, tell me some of our, quote, best Bible colleges and Christian colleges and all the students there that believed heretical things. And yet they'll graduate believing heretical things. And they'll go out of those schools believing heretical things. You say, why? Say, would that happen if they were proven in their local church? Say, because um, they have no authority. Say, they have no uh, accountability if they're not in uh, the local church. And by the way, all these schools have uh, graduated guys that literally are heretics today. I mean, literally, I mean, they're literally heretics. So um, that's important to keep in mind. Now, um, any question thus far? See, we're talking about, see, the biblical concept of the local church, you see. And uh, Paul started churches and nothing else, never started uh, a Christian organization. And then uh, um, there's much could be said. Uh, it's where the service for the Lord should be rendered. It's uh, the only Holy Spirit empowered uh, agency. And then uh, number 13, uh, it's the institution that is always in need of repentance. See, is the church perfect or God's children perfect? Absolutely not. But see, Revelation 2 and 3. See, the church is always called upon to repent. Now, what we're talking about, of course, is a New Testament church, a church that believes the teachings of the Bible. Not only they say, well, I believe the Bible, but do they believe the teachings of the Bible? Do they really believe what the Bible teaches? And a lot of times, see, uh, they would say no. Um, they just believe what they want to believe. They believe what their denomination believes. Uh, they believe what their school uh, believes, this, that, and the other thing. But now, see, in number uh, 14, see, and here it clears up the, the whole teaching about this matter, is that, uh, you see, the church is God's unique and only agency to receive tithes, offerings, and financial gifts from God's children. You see, now we're talking about giving and supporting God's work. See, the only place that anybody gave any money in the New Testament is to the local church, never outside the local New Testament church. See, um, a simple illustration. In the Old Testament, could a Jew, an Israelite, bring their sacrifice and sacrifice it any place they wanted to sacrifice it. 
No, they had to bring it to the t- tabernacle. They had to bring it to the temple. Now, now, if somebody did that outside, you see, uh, the Bible teaches that they were to be separated from the nation of Israel. They were to be excommunicated from the nation of Israel. See, God, uh, all the giving was in the Old Testament to the uh, temple uh, earlier, the tabernacle. And that's why a lot of people refer to it as storehouse tithing. But it's very clear uh, what uh, the giving was and how they did it in the Old Testament. And it was always uh, through the, the temple. Now, um, today, uh, it's the churches. See, nowhere in the Bible, this is interesting, does the Bible ever uh, use an individual, I'm talking about the churches now, in the churches, Paul never uses an individual as an example in giving. You see, because as we studied previously, God measures our giving not by what we give, but what we have left over after our uh, giving. But you see, any school that ever asks you for money, you know they don't know what the Bible teaches about the local church because they have no authority to ask for money or to receive money outside the local church. See, they believe, see, in these Christian organizations, they all beg for money. And by the way, you can get on lying. It's called Ministry Watch. And you can see the salaries uh, that, are, that go on in some supposedly good Christian organizations. You can check it out. Check their salaries. Uh, check the, the amount that they have coming in. And they, and they have millions of dollars. Some Christian organizations, hard to believe, have billions of dollars come in every year. Billions, you see, and um, uh, w- one thing or another. So you, by the way, you can check all this out. It's called Ministry Watch, and it will tell you the financial status, how much they pay their CEOs, their presidents, the people in authority, how much money they got in the bank, how much they take in, how much they give, and you can check them all out. And it's uh, very revealing, you see. But uh, anybody that ever asks for money, you see, outside the local church, see, that shows they know nothing about what the Bible teaches about the local church. See, and what they are saying, you see, we might illustrate this to marriage. See, God instituted marriage. Now, God's the authority on marriage. Okay, so what do people say about marriage today? See, the average person today says, I know more about marriage than God does. So I can have two or three wives, I can marry a man and all this kind of stuff. But you see, who's the authority on marriage? And it's God. It's we find it in the book of Genesis and verified by Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, amen? No question about that. But see, people say, we know more than God. Just like um, just recently in the Methodist church, they officially voted as a denomination to ordain homosexuals and approve of same-sex marriages and to have someone like that as a pastor of their church in the Methodist church. They voted unanimously uh, on that and uh, to pass that. Now, a lot of churches have left the Methodist denomination as a result of it. And even the Methodist churches in Africa said that we are severing relationships with the worldwide Methodist church that's located in America because they said the American Methodist church is in heresy where, uh, because of approving uh, same-sex marriages, homosexuality, and pastors that are contrary to the Bible. And they say that years ago, your missionaries came and preached that it was wrong. And now you're telling us that it's right. You see, and, um, but you see, uh, in that uh, denomination, you see that type uh, of a thing, all types of weird things. So we're talking about churches that are Bible-believing New Testament uh, churches. Now, say, but when somebody says, I have a Christian organization, and our Christian organizations know how to do, we know how to do God's work 
more than what the Bible says about the local church. Say, we are an improvement on the local church. Say, our radio broadcast, our, uh, our teaching, our Bible school, whatever it is. Say, we know more than the Bible about this. Say, we are a greater authority than the Bible. Say, and uh, see the point I'm getting at? Now, wait a minute. Who laid down the laws about marriage? See, that's God's institution. And you can't improve it. Nobody can come and say, I know more about marriage than the Bible. A lot of people say that today. You see, now when it comes to the church, God instituted the church. God ordained the church. God is the founder of the church. And nobody outside the church can say that they have a greater insight now. They know more than God and the Bible. Now, any question or comment or any observation in religion? Yeah, well, again, uh, I don't think it's scriptural. Because, see, it's not, see, what he is saying, see, and um, is that basically he knows more than what the Bible says about evangelism. Now, if you want to learn about evangelism, study the Bible. Amen. Study what the Bible says about evangelism. You see, and um, he says a lot of good things, but he's totally apart from the church. See, that's a good illustration. See, he's saying, I know more than Jesus Christ. I know more about evangelism than Jesus Christ. You want to learn about evangelism? How did Jesus deal with Nicodemus? How did he deal with the woman at the well? How did he deal with the thief on the cross? See, we take our authority from the Bible, not a man. And see, by the way, I, I'd be interested for somebody to check out on Ministry Watch how much money he takes in and what his personal salary is. Check it out. It's called Ministry Watch. Uh, but you see, no, see what they're saying. That's a good illustration. They know more than the Bible. See, and uh, they say, well, we're teaching the Bible. No, they're not. They're saying they know more than the Bible. See, and then all these organizations say that we can improve the church. See, they're saying they know more than the church. See, that is why I do not know of a magazine or a publication that I recommend, and most everybody knows I don't recommend any. Because if I found one that was true to the Bible, I would recommend it. I don't know of any that are true to the Bible. See, now again, keep in mind, see, somebody says, well, this is my organization, and we criticize the church. Church don't know what it's doing. Well, I know more than the church. See, and they're outside the church. See, that's unscriptural. See, and um, by the way, it's very easy to get involved in a Christian organization. See, it, you don't have uh, uh, to change a lot of diapers and so forth. You just sit behind a desk and bring in all this money and... Uh, you don't have to deal with the real world a lot of times. Anybody else have a, have a question? Mm -hmm. Most of these organizations don't believe in the local churches, but they believe in the universal, invisible churches. Right. That's the, the spirit of ecumenicalism. Yeah. That's the end time spirit. Yeah, well, I think that's a good point. There is no such thing as this universal, invisible church. Yeah. See, now all the Bible teachers on radio preach that, everybody. But you see... This is the thing. Every time the word church is used, it's always in a local church context. Can you imagine the New Testament Christians thinking, oh, we're members of this worldwide invisible? See, it's totally ridiculous. See, every verse in the epistle must be interpreted in the light of the New Testament church. It's context. But... Um, See, everybody believes that today, and all these organizations. See, they say, well, we're members of the body of Christ. You see, and uh, by the way, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when it talks about the body of Christ, see, in 1 Corinthians 12, it's in the context of the local church. And he says, you Corinthians are the body of Christ. And to, to think some universal worldwide kingdom, say, it's not there. See, it's the church. And that has led a lot of people astray. And I believe that those people 
are off, and I believe that's a heresy. And I believe if you really get back to it, I think a lot of it has to do uh, with people who are Presbyterian background or they're, see, they don't believe in believer's baptism. So those verses in the epistles, they say that's talking about the local church or the universal church. But um, I don't think they have a leg to stand on. See, and then all those people, when it comes to the Bible, and for instance, say the book of Corinthians, see, say in chapter five, it's talking about church discipline. Now they'll preach on that, but they don't realize in the context, it's, it's talking about the local church. There's no such thing as a universal church. And um, as someone has said, can you imagine any Christian in the New Testament when they read the word church in the Bible, which means to be called together? Say, now again, there's a distinction here. A lot of people say it means to be called out. Literally called together, the assembly. That's what the word means, assembly. And uh, um, the, uh, see, a lot of people do not get a hold of that. They don't realize that. See, and can you imagine anybody in the New Testament interpreting the word church in any other way than the local church? It's impossible. See, but that's what theologians do that don't believe in believer's baptism and uh, they believe in a lot of other weird things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The deception of things in Christianity is very deep, and the reason that I say that is because in the book that I've just recently read, which is the, um, being able to deceive, you know, to, to decipher um, deception in general, the book was a very good book, which was uh, in and wood. But it's unfortunate now that we're speaking here that even in stuff that's teaching us what they're saying is true doctrine isn't really because that book, those people, those two gentlemen who wrote that book believe in the universal church. Right, yeah. And then and, and that gives them... For us, that's why it's got to be the Holy Spirit teaching us and guiding yeah. us, period. And right. anybody who's saved, that's how it's done. Yeah. Because and then, then... That I read recently, yeah. if it wasn't that they were... Uh, celebrating someone who we like Martin Luther or other people, they yeah. believed in either the universal church, and in every one of the books they would slip up and say something that was very detrimental to the deception that they were trying to teach us from. You know what right. I'm saying? It's very, like, it's really bad. Yeah, and uh, you get back to the Reformation, see, they go back to the Reformation, and see, a lot of those uh, universal people, uh, if you really check them out, they believe that the Catholic Church was the true church before the Reformation. See, it's ridiculous. See, see truth is truth, and um, truth is powerful, and truth is more powerful than error. And these people, when they start, like, say, dealing with some of this stuff, it's so idiotic, it's so foolish, because they have no biblical basis to stand on. See, and they, don't, they don't really interpret the Bible. They interpret the Bible the way they want it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, Pastor. What is sad about all this is that these people they use the, the the word of God for their own benefit pushes people away. Right. You know, and it's hard to win these <coughs> people. That is sad. Right. You know, because they use the word of God for their own benefit. That's it. Yeah. But the thing we're simply pointing out, say everybody is off on the local church. Very few people believe in what the Bible teaches about the local church. Say, um, no one has a right to say, this is my ministry. No, ministry is found in the Bible. It has to be based on the Bible. It's okay for a person that I want, like feel, go to preach every Saturday outside. It's okay for that person that has that feeling? Oh, absolutely. And uh, see, every child of God should be a witness. And uh, all of us ought to be witnessing, amen? All of us ought to be... Uh, witnessing in one way or another, we ought to be faithful to the, to the Lord. And, uh, but again, it's just like when we do lead somebody to the Lord, we encourage them to get in the church, amen? See, so they can get baptized and grow and develop and uh, uh, so forth. See, the ministry is done by God's children, not inside the church, but outside the church. That gets into us another thing, as I've said a, a million times, See, the purpose of the church is to preach the word of God, to build up God's children. 
the ministry is done outside the church, not inside the church. That's why, can you think of any organization or ministry that you find in the, uh, in the New Testament church? There's only one, and that was in the New Testament church. Remember, uh, Paul talks about helping the, the widows. See, and uh, now in the New Testament, they didn't have social security, and they were, they were the poorest of the poor. They, and he said they have to be widows indeed, and then they had to have spiritual qualifications for the church to support them. And remember, the Bible says they had to be people of prayer night and day who were faithful in ministering to the Lord all their lives, so there's qualifications. See, it wasn't a handout. That, I think, uh, to my knowledge, is the only organization or ministry through the local church is to help the widows of those days. You see, there are all, this, all, this, uh, all these organizations that people say, well, say, this is a great organization from God. Say, I believe it's all unscriptural unless it's based on the Bible. But every Christian ought to be a witness for Christ. Just back to the body of Christ, when you read the context, the Apostle Paul was writing to the people at the Church of Corinth, uh, of Corinthian, Corinth. But he said, ye, he used the word ye, I mean the people that he wrote to. Because if he were writing to a universal church, he should use we, just like in first book of first John, chapter one, verse nine, when the <coughs> apostle John was writing to the people, he said, if we confess our sin, that means included him. Because that is the, when you read that, the Bible is very precise when we use ye, that means that he wrote it, the people at Corinth, they said, ye are the body of the local church. So, so that's the thing, the people always use, oh, we are the body of Christ. But when you read the context, it's a local church. Yeah. Whereas when we, the apostle John used the word we, he first showed if we confess our sins, that means included here. Right. See, and the other thing, like you bring out First John. Remember in First John, it says there, I believe it's First John 2, they went out from us because they were not of us. Well, where did they go out from? See, they went out from the local church. See, but people don't interpret it that way. See, where did they come out from? They came out from the local church. Now, another interesting thing is that Peter says, there will be false teachers arise among you. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the local church. See, and that's why... It, we need to take our stand on doctrine. We need to be very careful that we don't let false doctrine in. But when it says there'll be false teachers among you, it's talking about the church. See, and how we need to take our stand against false doctrine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't you think those who are saved, like ourselves here, when Jesus said, talking about de deception in general, now that we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and I believe that's who's taught me and I don't understand the Bible in general, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Right. So don't you think as saved people, we would hear deception or see deception? Yes, uh, that's true, but uh, many do not. See, see, a lot of them bring it in. And, and as we mentioned before, why is it brought in? See, to pat people on the back, to get money, to get numbers. And it's nice to uh, pat somebody on the back, say, well, I know you're a heretic, but you come in and boy, you'll bring a lot of money into our church. See, that type of thing. Yeah, 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 that's why, uh, see, and then of course the Bible teaches, see, regenerate church membership, which means that only saved people should be in the church. See, like I was talking to a pastor fellow, uh, you, know, you know, Danny, he used to be in the church years ago, you remember Danny, uh, Danny Sardinas, and he's a pastor now down in Florida. And uh, so anyway, he was in this Southern Baptist church, and um, he said that there in Florida, everybody joins the church by letter. Say so they come and they say, I'm a Christian because everybody's a Baptist down there. So they join by letter. And he said, half those people are not saved. They don't know the Lord. And uh, by the way, he withdrew from the Southern Baptist Convention. He went independent. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, uh, what, what he was saying, all you have to do in the Southern Baptist churches come forward and say, uh, I was a member of the other Baptist church, so you come in by, by letter, and people uh, are not saved. And um, he mentioned that, uh, he said, that's why 
See, and this is why he got out of the convention. They went independent, and the church voted to go independent. But uh, he said because, see, you can have the biggest pervert in town join your church by letter. See, uh, and he said, he said to his people, he said, we would have to kick half the people out of the church that joined the church by letter. So, and, and anyway, but he said it's a, a, it's a mess. And uh, um, see, he said, you got to make sure people are saved. Now, this is somebody who in, was in the Southern Baptist. He withdrew from it. He said, most of those people, know, now this is him, a, pa a Baptist pastor, said they don't know the Lord. They're not saved. They are not saved. See, because they can come in through all these different ways. And uh, he says the church, uh, the church just pats them all on the back and brings them all in. And because uh, you don't have to have a testimony to be a member of those churches. Yeah, just I believe in Jesus. So you can be the biggest crook in town and be, uh, believe in Jesus. But anyway, um, see, one word, and, and we'll get into our regular classes next week. You uh, plan on uh, teaching those next week. But um, the thing, see, this. This is one of the most important Bible doctrines. It's neglected, and hardly anybody understands what the Bible teaches about the local church. Very few people that I've met, very few pastors, um, very few Bible uh, college uh, professors are straight on the local church. Usually, uh, like I know one Bible college, and uh, you all know of it, and uh, there's one teacher down there, and he, he, he would say, basically, I'm the only one in this school that believes in a local church. See what I mean? See, they all say they believe it, you know what I mean? But he says they don't teach what the Bible teaches about the local church.